Good evening and welcome to the Wide World of Wayne podcast. I'm Wayne Viner alongside Cordell Woodland and you are listening to us from the Viner Four Gate Studios in Rockville. So this week's edition we should have Kevin Sheehan on from Sports Talk 980 in a few minutes. I'm going to talk a little bit of Maryland football, the joy about the Maryland basketball team, and we'll get into both of those with Kevin and maybe a little Redskins, because Cordell, even more so than I am, is still plugged in to the team that used to be known as the Washington Redskins. All right. Right. I can't help it. <laughs> can't get away. Have you actually tried to stop being I, a fan? You know, Wayne, I actually have tried. I actually have. I, I've made a, I try to make a conservative effort to actually make myself busy when I know that the scans game on, but it's it's just a trigger in my mind. It's, it's a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a beast of habit, and I, I can't help but just tune in just to find something to be happy about. And, man, it, I mean, obviously, it's, it's becoming harder and harder each week. How long have you been a fan? My whole life. I was uh, Sadly, I was born into it, so I'm literally bleeding burgundy and gold. Well, I started, I grew up in West Virginia, if you can believe that or not. And I picked up the Redskins because they were on television. My family actually wasn't into sports. And I became, by about 1974, 75, just a Washington Redskin nut. Right. And it's, it's really taken... Well, and then I fell in love with Maryland soon after that. So I had two teams every weekend. But I finally distanced myself enough from the Redskins that, unlike you... Mason, Jordan, all the people I talk to all the time, you guys are still a little further into this than I am. I just can't see spending more time caring about them. It's not watching the game. It's the way the game makes me feel. So it's taken a while to beat that out of me. But it's happened. And now if I miss a game, it's not the worst thing in the world, but I do wish they were a little bit better. So I will say this. I, I have gotten better at, uh, at just watching the game um, and not getting emotionally attached. Uh, I mean, granted, the record is what it is, so that helps. But I'm able to watch the game now and not get upset when I see us lose. I'm literally now just watching the game. I'm really watching it for Haskins. And just to find, you know, I'm, I'm watching the younger guys. I'm just watching the Ron Payne, the Jonathan Islands, watching their development, really. I'm just keeping my eye on them. Well, that's a good thing to do. There are some good young players. It's just a bad team. And I'm a yeah. little, it's not jealous. I just remember when the Redskins used to have a good Monday night record, when the Redskins used to have the game of the week. And it's fine that the Ravens do, and the Ravens-Patriots game was a lot of fun. It was just more fun when it was our guys. And, well, anyhow, uh, it's getting close to that same feeling at Maryland. And I'm just there to see the guys that I know. Now, the college team is a little different because both you and I sort of know some of the players from doing all the interviews. And it, it's even harder to watch them lose when you actually know who they are. But they do keep losing. Yeah. Yeah, they do continue to lose. And, I mean, we saw this at the start of the season. This is the gauntlet part of their schedule. So, it's, you know, these are games that whether they were having a good year or not, these were going to be tough games for them to win regardless. It doesn't help that they've had the injury issues that they've had all the way uh, up to this point. Um, but, yeah, we're at the point of the season in Maryland football where now you're trying to look at the younger guys, the Lance Lejean, um, and just try to go from there, try to – try to get some sort of light out of this season that seems to be lost. But, you know, the good part is it's just Moxley's first year. He's inherited, in a, you know, a team. He, he did a, as good a job as he possibly could in the transfer transfer portal uh, this past all season. So now it's just looking to get those building blocks um, going that, you, that this team can help turn the culture around. You've got to get bigger. There's no yeah. doubt in my mind we need some bigger guys. If they have to go in the Midwest to find what they're looking for, that's okay with me. I don't, I'm not really that concerned of whether or not Loxley and Maryland can recruit outside of the D.C. area. He's supposed to be building a fence around the DMV, but we really need 
some of the same size and type of linemen that I saw up close at Minnesota that even you saw at Indiana uh, when Indiana came to town just don't have that size. I'm a little concerned about the Loxley overall record. I think by the end of the season, it's going to be close to 6-40. and 40. I don't like those numbers, but I still think he can do it here in College Park. No, I, I definitely agree. I, uh, the numbers, is, the, the record is definitely alarming. Um, but it's, it's, it's more so the vibe. I, I think, I think Loxley has a lot of respect in the, in the football community, uh, especially in this area. Um, so I, I think that'll help when it comes to recruiting them. Recruiting hasn't been that great for them this season, uh, in state at least. Um, but I, I, I just I'm trying to hold out hope for Lossy because I like I like him as a coach, and I, I I I actually see a little bit of his vision that he's trying to push uh, for this team. So hopefully that they they are able to turn turn it around. But like you said, they've got to get bigger because we all know in football if you can't win on the on the interior line on either side of the ball, it's going to be tough uh, to win any game. I think that there's a culture issue, and the culture issue is that after Loxley went and learned from Saban, he really does expect the student-athletes to motivate themselves, to carry themselves professionally, to already come to the game, to come to practice with the willingness to lay your body on the line that it's all about Maryland football. And I think that that view is a little different than what the student athletes had before. They were getting screamed at and yelled at and pushed to have to get that edge. And he wants you to get that edge on your own because he isn't always going to be there. That's the dad part. When he says this is a family, he's trying to teach these kids how to motivate themselves it's not just about football. You right. need to motivate yourself all the time. You need to do what you have to do. And I think he's going to need more players that already buy into that philosophy that they mm-hmm. want to self-motivate. And see, that was my thing with Loxy coming in. Uh, I remember on media day for football this year, I asked him how what, what did he think would be the biggest challenge um, coming from a powerhouse like Alabama to a team at Maryland that's trying to change the culture, they're trying to move their way up out of the basement of the Big Ten. And, you know, he said he took it as more so as an opportunity, as a challenge. But I, I looked at the reason I wanted to know is because when you're coming from a team like Alabama, where you have the best talent in the nation, you know, you're, you're with the best coach in the nation, like you said, a lot of those guys – it doesn't, it doesn't take much for them to be motivated because just putting on that jersey lets you know what you have to go out there and do. So it's a different story, you know, here at Maryland where he's got a lot of guys that aren't – they may not even be the most talented. Like you brought up many a times, they're lacking size. Maryland just doesn't have the team that uh, to really match up with a lot of the teams that they face in the conference. So it is going to be a journey for Los And maybe it is a little bit tougher than he may have initially thought. Um, but hopefully he is able to turn it around. Well put. You are listening to The Wide World of Wayne, and this podcast, as all of our podcasts are, are brought to you by Viner Four Gates Consulting. If you need a new website, if you have issues with your network, especially if you're concerned about cybersecurity, call Viner Four Gates to come in and take a look at your system, give you the best recommendations, and help you put it all together. You can reach Viner Forgates at 301-251-2900 or on the web at www.1viner.com. That's the numeral one. V is in victory. I-E-N as in November. E-R dot com. 301-251-2900. We are going to take a break here for a moment. And you'll hear about the Young Terps in that break. And we'll be back with Kevin Sheehan to talk Maryland basketball. This is Mason Viner. Listen to the Young Terps podcast on CapitalSportsBlog.com and TerpTalk.com, the number one rated Maryland sports podcast. Welcome back to the Wide World of Wayne podcast. Joining us is Kevin Sheehan from Sports Talk 980. Kevin, welcome in this evening. What's up, guys? How you doing? 
Uh, we're, we're doing good. I had a great time at the Maryland game last night. Takes me off of all my football problems. Redskins, Maryland. It's much better to go out to College Park when you got the number seven team in the country. When do you figure you're going to make your first stop to Xfinity Center this year? Oh, boy. Um, I, I, I might be there Saturday night. It all depends. But I would, I would guess that I'll definitely be there for the Notre Dame game, you know, um, you know, and probably a few of them after that, Illinois maybe after that. But I, I, I was looking at the schedule last night, actually, as they were playing. I was watching it on BTN+. Plus. Um, but uh, I think Notre Dame probably will be the first time I'm out there, but I, I might be out there for Rhode Island Saturday night. Well, we're, we're excited for Rhode Island, but 9 o'clock's a, a tough time to get started when you're still in these early games. Uh, Cordell has been following the team, one of the biggest fans around, of course. Cordell, what, yeah. do, you, what do you see in the near future for these Maryland Terps? Oh, well, I think they're the, one of the deepest teams in the country, so really the sky's the limit for this team. Uh, of course, hindering anything barring health reasons, uh, I think Maryland can go as deep definitely deeper into the tournament. The goal for this team this year, I think, should be at least Sweet 16, possibly an Elite uh, 8 run. But we know it's driven by Anthony Cowan and Jalen Smith. But, man, these guys are deep. And Daryl Morsell coming off the bench is such a luxury uh, for this team that a lot of other teams aren't don't don't have, especially with a team that's as young as Maryland, to have a junior, the, you know, the, the old man on the team, coming off the bench and being able to give them that spark. I thought he did a great job last year in the tournament whenever it seemed like Maryland was starting to die down and hit a little dead run. And uh, Daryl Morsell would come in and give them a couple of buckets to help them get going. And we saw the same thing last night. Uh, so I think the sky's the limit for this team, definitely. My guy, my secret weapon has got to be Donta Scott. He is, anybody who's watched Maryland for a long time, remember, remember Sean Mosley. Donta Scott is a Sean Mosley, but he's a little bit bigger. He's built a little bit tougher. He could shoot. He could get to the basket. He can defend. And I talked to Sticks last night after the game, and that interview's up on TerpTalk.com, and I asked Sticks about Donta, and he said he could tell the difference when Donta Scott is on the floor. This is the first team that actually looks like a team. These aren't rented spare parts like they were a few years ago. This is the first total team I've seen there in years. Kevin, what's your perspective? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I like him. And, and I, I remember Mark telling me over the summer that we were all going to like him. You know, those tough Philly guys, they're, they're boxy, they're strong, um, and, you know, and they're, they're fearless. You know, you, I, I always love that about, like, just the whole Philadelphia high school basketball scene. And you'd see a lot of those, those guys playing for Temple and St. Joe's and, you know, that's a great place to recruit. And, you know, and he also, at this point, you know, you never know, but he looks like, you know, a multi-year player as well. But, you know, what Cordell said is so true. This team is is deep. And what we saw last night, I hope we continue to see, and that is playing with more pace. You know, they, they had made 79 shots last night. You know, last year they basically averaged somewhere around 60 or in the low 60s. It, it, their players, to me, are, are will thrive in more of an up-tempo, you know, higher possession game. Daryl Morsell, for sure. Cowan, Wiggins. Um, the, these are guys that, you know, and, and look, it's easier said than done. I mean, I, I remember having a conversation with Mark over the summer about this, and he's like, you know, you try, you know, you try to run against Beeline's Michigan teams or Matt Painter's Purdue teams. They get back so well, and that league is really – a, a real difficult league to run in, but Michigan State's been able to pull it off for years, and Illinois plays with great pace. I think Maryland will benefit from that. I think he's going to emphasize that this year, and I think you know where you'll see it definitely more, you know, than anywhere else. And is some of these early games, like last year, they opened up with Delaware, and they they were in a six point game. You know, they'll blow some of these teams out like they haven't if they play up tempo. And I just think it fits their their talent also. I think it's going to cut down on turnovers. They've played faster the past two games. The first game, which was an exhibition, and maybe Fayetteville State might have been as good as Holy Cross in some aspects, 
Maryland has six turnovers. Last night, at a very fast-paced game, Maryland has eight turnovers. They're very low numbers for watching Maryland play fast-break basketball. It's a great point because it's something that I've argued before, um, and that is, you know, a lot of coaches will fear, you know, playing too many possessions because they'll get loose with the ball. I think it's harder to run half-court offense, and I think you're more prone to turning it over against the set defense than you are against a set defense that's scrambling. And um, I think they'll learn that. I mean, they haven't always had the talent to play that way, but when you've got talent and you've got depth, more possessions are better than less possessions in a game. Um, I definitely agree with you guys because even if you look at the NBA game, not only does a faster pace possibly cut down on turnovers, but it all, it can also lead to open, more open looks. Uh, you know, if you beat the team up the floor, you could end up with some three-on-two situations, or even off the inbound, you're able to get up the court before the team is able to set up their defense. Well, no it, doubt. It looks no like doubt. it worked. It's, Last night and the night before, we'll see if, as Kevin said, if it works against the big boys. This year, Maryland has some tough depth. You talked about that there's a lot of guys, but we've got 6'10 twins in the middle. We didn't have that before. Both of them look like they can play. And then the secret weapon coming in after he sees the doctor on or about November 25th, Shoal Marial, about a 7'2 true center with about a 7-7 wingspan. He's a thin guy, but wow, you can put him at the back line and he's going to have to, he can change the game. I hope he can play basketball, but if he can, <laughs> he can change the game. Right <laughs> yeah, I mean, I hope he's healthy. You know, he's, he's had these, these issues with his legs and and I mean, personally, I'm not counting on on Scholl, you know, to, to provide much. If he does, that's awesome. Like if, if he's just a, a, a shot blocker and a rim protector, that would be great. Um, but you know, they're going to go as far as Anthony Cowan and Aaron Wiggins and Ricky Lindo and Stick Smith and, and Ayala take them. I mean, that that's you know, that's the group right there. And I, and I. I just have a sense that if they play a little bit more up-tempo, that Cowan's going to have a big year. Um, Marcel will have a big year. Wiggins will have a big year. Cordell hit the nail on the head, too, because when you run, you get more open looks from behind the arc. I mean, you get Cowan out on that break, and he gets inside the paint and kicks it back to a trailer, and, and, and it's Wiggins or it's Ayala, and you're getting open looks like, you know, sometimes they don't get in the half court. I, I – I'm excited to watch them this year. That you, I, I, I think that this, this is his team. That, as Cordell said, you know, it's a second weekend team, worst case, and hopefully, it's a lot later than that. Uh, absolutely, if it is going to happen in College Park for Mark Turgeon now in his ninth year, it's going to happen now. Th this is the shot. These guys, this team. So, if you want to come out and catch a team that you might see in the Final Four, and you haven't been to Xfinity Center for a while, it's time to come out and take a look at this. You'll like it. I guarantee it. All right, Cordell, you wanted to talk a little bit of Redskins. You've got the Redskin expert here. Go ahead. I do. I do. Well, Kevin, you know, it's, it's a lot of the same old, same old with this team uh, that's going on right now. But unlike... I feel like years in the past, we actually have a little bit of a future uh, with this team on both sides of the ball from the D-line uh, with, with uh, Bama boys, or the defense in general is just, just Bama boys central now. But, you know, with Haskins at quarterback, what's your thoughts on Haskins right now after his first start and a couple of, you know, off-the-bench appearances? I mean, I was not a big fan of him coming out as a first-rounder, but – I actually thought he played pretty well last week. I thought he really managed the game well. You know, there were no delay game penalties. There were no um, timeouts used because he didn't know the plays. Like, you know, all, all the concerns they had were not concerns, you know, on Sunday against Buffalo. I thought he made some really good throws in the game under pressure. Um, I just want to see him these final seven games. I mean, I, I hope Callahan – you know, uh, starts him against the Jets. I mean, it would be absolutely insane if he didn't. Um, but I, 
I'm, I'm more encouraged after seeing him Sunday than I've been before, and I, I just want to see more of him. I definitely agree with you, and they actually did announce that he will be the starter uh, against the Jets after the bye week, which is good because I felt like for a while I think he just needs reps. I think he's a smart guy. I think he can read the defense. I just think that it didn't help him having to come off the bench cold a lot of times, just thrown in a heat of, a heat of fire. And I don't know how much they were preparing him throughout the week. That was my biggest thing. I, I didn't like the fact that I kept hearing guys like Gruden say he's not ready He's not ready. Well, what does he have to do to be ready? And what are you doing to prepare him to be ready? And I feel like this week he was able to finally prepare to be a starter. And just like you, I thought he played decent Sunday. That was the best outing he's had. He made some good throws, some good reads. He didn't have too many mental lapses. I I just, I got to see a little bit of progression with him. Um, What are your thoughts on the, on the team as far as this upcoming season? What are you, because, do you feel like we're going to keep – I don't think that Callahan is going to be the coach uh, going into next season. What do you, how do you feel, as, feel they should go about the head coach? And should, do you think they should stay in-house or look out? By the way, where did you see that Haskins has already been named the starter for the Jet game? Uh, the ble- well, I got a, re- uh, a notification from Bleacher Report earlier saying that Callahan uh, announced him as the starter for the Jet game. I got a notification on the app The Score – that they were leaning that way. I didn't hear that they went final on it. Yeah, I, I don't. I, I don't know that it's been announced yet, but I, I I'd be shocked if it doesn't happen. Um, I'm expecting that. But I, you made a really good point, um, and it's this. You know, if he's not ready, get him ready. It's the right. coach's responsibility to put together a game plan that he's comfortable with, that he's confident in. We've seen it all around the league with rookie quarterbacks and young quarterbacks for a long period of time now. You you don't sit top half of the draft guys on bad football teams anymore. It just doesn't happen. You you know, this this idea that the Redskins are close, you hear Bruce Allen say it, you've heard Callahan refer to it, they're delusional. They're not close to anything. They they need to find out um, what they have in Dwayne Haskins. So if they... If they learn over the final eight weeks, I think he should have been starting four weeks ago. But I think if they learn that over the next eight weeks that, you know, they're concerned and they're not convinced that he's the guy, you know, if they're picking second or third, this is a quarterback loaded draft yeah. in April of 2020. Yeah. So um, they, they, they've got to be focused on 2020 and beyond. I'm not sure the organization is. I think they're really detached from reality. Um, they, they don't have much self-awareness at all as to what they are. They really believe that the last few weeks they've been real close to winning. I mean, I think we can all t- no, I think we all know that if Ryan Fitzpatrick had played more than one quarter in that Miami game, they would have lost that game. They'd be 0 and yeah. 9. They um, would. They're be. a terrible football. They're look, a terrible football team look, right now. Haskins um, with a little bit of talent on defense, but they are. They're, they're, they're among the worst teams and among the worst organizations right now in the league. In the league? In sports? You can add, it's the Knicks, yeah, I would, yeah, I would the Knicks it, and I, the Redskins. I, top five, top three, bottom three to five in all of sports. Okay. No Maybe the bottom two. So yeah. Haskins actually, by some odd sense here, is playing for his job. If he plays well and they win a couple games, they don't have the top three draft pick and they're not going to get Tua or Burrow from LSU. If he actually comes in and he's horrible and they they win one game, he's pretty much put himself in a position to get drafted over. It, it's weird how this worked out. Well, the per- the perfect the perfect result would be to see him play well, to improve, to get to the end of the season feeling like he's the guy, but they don't win another game. Like he he plays really well, but they lose a bunch of close <laughs> games. And then they can pick Chase Young. Yeah. They can pick oh, Jerry Judy. Oh. Yeah, so that would be the best. I, yeah, yeah, I want Chase Young, and I know we still need uh, an offensive line. Look, the offensive line is in tatters still, although yeah. Eric Flowers has played well enough to keep his job. There's a possibility that Sh- uh, Sheriff doesn't come back. I think Penn has had it. You know, you might be looking at two or three new starters on the offensive line. You're going to have a new tight end. What do you think, this wasn't supposed to be all about the Redskins, folks, but since we stepped in here. So for those who say, look, 
you got to look at this team and say they spent a ton of money on a starting quarterback who might never play again, except in Bruce Allen's dreams. They have a guy who's supposed to be the number one running back who has had seven carries in two years. They have a franchise-level tight end that they're paying a lot. He's never going to play again. The backup tight end is never probably going to play again on this team. You have a pro Bowl left tackle who gets paid a lot, so your salary cap as we go through the story is disappearing left and right. He's never going to play here again. You spent a ton of money on a safety that they like, but eh, he's okay. And if you add all those people up, that's such a big salary cap hit that th there's no wiggle room. It's no surprise if you invest that much money in seven guys that are never going to see the field and one guy who might be an overpaid safety. I don't know how you're going to win with that. And I don't think there's enough, I guess that's blame. I wouldn't say it's credit enough blame to say however you guys figure this out you spent the bulk of your money on players who you will get nothing for possibly ever and that they oh, just man. haven't been oh, man you you just you just painted a beautiful picture there that's that's really that's really encouraging well but you're uh, right you're that's right. where that's we are they should yeah they should have rebooted the whole thing in january yeah. that's what i was advocating but when you should have blown the whole thing up taking the you know, taking the poison pill with Alex Smith this year and moved yep. on for exactly. you know, thinking about 2020. But they don't think that way. They they, they think six and three last year yep. they were headed to the Super Bowl. I know. And um, you know, and most people okay. who watched them know that they weren't. All right. I know everybody has other things to do. We got to wrap this up. I got one more uh, for Kevin. You seem to have a heck of a lot more faith in Danny Snyder for doing something right next. If they get rid of Bruce this year and next year, whenever Bruce Allen goes away, that they are going to be better off. And that's the part that kills my fandom. I don't think with him running the show, and you know he the NFL helped him with Brian LaFamina, and that went really well. The guy lasted nine months. Schottenheimer had it going in the right direction. The guy lasted a year. Anybody who's any good doesn't last here. Why in the world should I have any faith that no matter where Danny gets his advice, that the next move will work? You shouldn't. I mean, I don't have any faith. I, I, I'm not. I, I, don't, I, I don't know if you said that. I no, I didn't. Dan but Snyder. but sometimes yeah, yeah, no, you're my I, redskin I, I, I sherpa. Think, you're my guru think, on this. I think that's the problem. Is that you know, and that and that's the reality of the situation. Is that you know, Bruce is a major problem. But even if Bruce is gone. Dan's still there. He owns the team. And, yep. you know, we've got 20 years of track record that says he can't do it and that this organization is a complete dysfunctional mess with him in charge. And that's why I think, you know, for a lot of people, they've, they've, they've given up, you know, and that's why a lot of the fan bases eroded. It's like, okay, so you come back at the end of this year, you fire Bruce, which I don't know if that'll happen. Um, and you try to, you know, who wants to work for Snyder? Nobody does. Nobody wants to work for him with, with yeah. Allen and the organization. Um, they've got a better shot of hiring somebody to come in if Allen isn't there. But, you know, do you have any confidence that Snyder would be able to identify the kind of person yeah. that you need to run the organization? Well, my point is, help. my point is, is that a couple of times he has. And as soon as the guy turns out to go That's a little right. different direction, he goes, oh, I made a mistake. You're out of here. Cordell, you totally. worked inside. You're the you're our inside source. How long did you work for the Redskins? Uh, I was there for about seven months. <laughs> and that's <laughs> he enough. Wanted out. Then he wanted out. You know what? We'll pick yeah. up on this <laughs> next time. But, uh, guys, thanks for joining in. Kevin, thank you so much for taking the time to drop in on the podcast. Uh, Cordell? My pleasure, Wayne. My pleasure. And Cordell, great catching up, man. Oh, your voice. Kevin. Same, same. Well, Cordell, that wraps up this episode for the first week of November for the Wide World of Wayne podcast. It was really fun to have Kevin on. You sounded like you had a great time. Oh, definitely. It's always great to talk to Kevin. You called him the guru, and that's and man, that's a, that's an understatement, man. Kevin knows uh, his his history on on football and on the Redskins and just DC sports in general, man, is untouchable. So it's always great to talk sports with him. All righty, so that'll wrap it up here from the Viner Four Gate Studio. And once again, if you need network help, 
security for your business on the web, call Viner Four Gates at 301 251 2900. Cordell, thanks for being on, and we will see you on the Sports Maven at 9 a.m. on Saturday. That's 1300 CBS Sports Radio. And then after the game, the basketball game, not the football game this week, we're going to do a post game show live from the Florida Xfinity Center after the Maryland Rhode Island game. We will see you then. Thanks for listening.